In part one of my fungus adventures with Daniel Zayance, he introduced me to a number of mushroom species that are local to the coastal temperate rainforest in the Pacific Northwest. This time, Dan shares some advice on how to harvest and identify mushrooms, highlighting some popular edible species, and I take a few specimens back to the lab to show you how to make spore prints. Although we do find and describe some edible mushrooms in this video, remember to always use a proper identification guide or seek expert help when collecting mushrooms for consumption, especially if you are new to foraging for fungi. All right, so what I think we have here is um, a species of pine spike. Um, the woolly pine spike grows quite abundantly in our forest here in the Pacific Northwest um, and are associated with uh, a number of our conifer trees. And so when you harvest a mushroom to double check what it is, um, you cut it from the bottom here, the stipe, um, and then aiming to make sure that you don't disturb the, the duff or soil underneath. And underneath here we see that the gills, so this is a gilled mushroom, um, they kind of come down almost like dishes in a dish rack. Um, they don't go all the way down the stipe, that's this long part, some people might think of it as a stem. Um, and so uh, I think that this is quite different than your typical golden chanterelle. Um, and uh, by harvesting it this way, we can do a spore print and further attempt to identify what kind of mushroom this is um, by bringing it back to, well, we might bring it back to a lab or bring it back to our house and put it on some papers. And by cutting it this way, you can tell that um, it almost looks like nobody was here. And the mycorrhizal community um, and mycelia underneath are not disturbed. Um, by digging up the dirt underneath. So I'm not sure what this is, but what we're going to look at here is how at the top, um, the uh, cap here, or pileus, um, it's got this kind of distinctive shape. And when you're identifying mushrooms, you want to kind of look at what might the cap shape be. So is it acutely umbinate? Is it bell-shaped? Is it broadly umbinate or conical? It's certainly not plain from as far as we can tell. Um, my temptation is to think that it's somewhere in these three ranges. And to identify it, um, one of the best ways is to uh, collect it and then bring it back and check a, a better identification guide or go to an expert with it. Um, I learned a lot of the mushroom identification that I have um, based on going to mushroom forays organized by local um, fungus festivals. Um, and what we see here is that underneath, and maybe Owen if you can get a little bit closer, it seems that we have brown spores. So those brown spores could be a very useful ident identifying feature for this mushroom. Sometimes Cordonarius um, ha have, have this kind of shape here. So we'll put this into our trusty and not very dusty um, egg carton and we will uh, attempt to identify it further later with the uh, slippery jack and the pine spike. Hey Dan. Yeah. By cutting that mushroom out, aren't you impacting its ability to reproduce? Are you affecting the population of mushrooms around here at all? That's a good question, Owen. Um, Basically, by collecting the mushroom that was here, that's a fruiting body. And so around all throughout here, this mushroom has a web. You can imagine this web having all the connections of the internet all over the world. And it's um, processing nutrients, decomposing nutrients, collecting nutrients and giving them to other plants, collecting nutrients from plants for itself and it has a mycorrhizal relationship with a lot of the trees in this forest here. So by collecting the fruiting body, yes, it's not gonna be able to um, sporulate uh, as efficiently as it was previously when it was standing, but it's already left hundreds of thousands of spores into the environment and itself will probably grow back a new fruiting body later on in the season. All right, so we are in uh, one of my favorite chanterelle spots. People are quite uh, secretive about their chanterelle spots, but um, 
here we are at the marine station and uh, uh, normally we have a fungus festival here and one year we had a chanterelle as the background so what we're looking for is something like this and underneath these ferns is a spot where I often find them and so I'm gonna cut this one loose here I think these chanterelles are just absolutely beautiful um, this is the Pacific golden chanterelle so they have vein like gills that go all the way down to the stipe the top um, often has a very can have very different shapes and morphology here we've got two fruiting bodies that have kind of grown together here's the stipe the cap the gills and then the top here which is this beautiful kind of orange color um, and uh, we found these growing under something so you might expect them to be a little bit longer seeking out the the sunlight as far as the morphology goes uh, than you're something that's growing on the ground normally um, I absolutely love chanterelles they're my favorite one to eat and uh, I'm gonna take these back home for dinner you know walking by this tree uh, we both noticed that there's mushrooms growing uh, in the root structure and so way up here um, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, it seems as if uh, we have a winter chanterelle there. So there's a seasonality to mushrooms and these come up a little bit later than your uh, uh, golden chanterelles and actually last through the winter time. Uh, pretty cool. They've got they're kind of more hollow type, st type stipe. Um, we don't want to dirty our environment, make it kind of ugly to look around. So a good um, mushroom practice when you're harvesting is to when you've got something like this get it off uh, the, the road um, so that you know people that are walking the trail don't see uh, leftover bits of mushrooms all over the place so sometimes you have this idea of a mushroom that you've seen before that grows in the same place and then you go back and somebody's already picked it which that's awesome good for them um, but this used to be a bear's head mushroom um, and it has lots of names it can grow up to 50 pounds um, some, pe some people call it the pom-pom de blanc you can imagine these pom-poms um, and they can grow, grow, grow quite large 50 pounds or so uh, what else does it say here um, a beautiful mushroom unfortunately we don't get to see it today but it's a toothed fungus so toothed fungus fungi they they ha let out their spores basidio spores through teeth underneath and it's a very defining characteristic for a number of different mushrooms but this is a delicious mushroom mushroom and someone's enjoyed it for their dinner lunch or maybe even breakfast hey dan what are some of the tools that you're using out here in the forest for your mushroom collection oh all right well um i mean first things first everyone needs a uh, nice hat to have extra confidence in the forest. Um, but uh, what you really want is some sort of knife. This is a, an awesome uh, gift for your, your mushroom hunter. Uh, it is a mushroom knife that, you know, you cut the mushroom like so, and then uh, you can actually brush off um, the little bits of dirt and uh, needles and pine needles that are growing on the, the mushroom. Um, if you're trying to identify what mushrooms are, you might want to put them and separate them in something like a milk carton. People like to separate them with waxy paper. Um, here we've got it just like this. That should be fine. Um, you always want to bring some mushroom guides to kind of have an idea of what you're looking for when you go back to your home or lab. Um, I am a big fan of All That the Rain Promises and More by David Aurora. It's a kind of a hip hop pocket guide for a fungophile, so someone that is interested and loves fungi. Um, and David Aurora also has a larger book called Mushrooms Demystified that um, is probably the most popular uh, uh, book for mushrooming, if you will. I have another book in here um, that I use more for the specific uh, mushrooms in this area. And there's also a book, uh, Mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest, which is great. But if you are a fungophile in this fungophobic uh, society that we live in, um, there are some ways to gain knowledge that I think are invaluable. One is going out with experts and a good way to do that is to look up some local forays in your area. Um, the Vancouver Mycological Society does some great stuff. 
out of Vancouver. There's the South Vancouver Island Mycological Society. Recently, I started following an Instagram account by the Vancouver Mycological Society, which has great content um, for your average fungophile, maybe like myself. Um, and then uh, that's about it for um, things you want to bring with you in the forest. You want a knife and and this uh, a mushroom bag. Mine uh, is made of palm and actually um, stretches out. So when I collect lots and lots and lots of chanterelles, it looks like it's small, but then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's almost like a, a jellyfish floating away. Hey, Danny. Hello. I noticed you're wearing your Banfield Fungus Festival shirt. Sure am. Uh, the purple one is one of my favorites, but here's an older version from a previous iteration of that fungus festival. Right on. Making your own spore prints is super easy and requires only a few basic materials. It can also be really useful in helping you identify some of the mushrooms you bring back from the forest. Now that I've brought my mushrooms back, I'm going to select one. Then I'm going to trim off a little bit more of the stipe so that it'll lie flat. I'm going to put this mushroom cap gill side down on a piece of white paper and cover it with a bowl or a glass. The goal of making a spore print is to be able to see the colors of the spores that the mushroom is producing. That color can be really useful in helping identify a mushroom. Spore prints are really reliable because the spore color is going to be the same no matter what other environmental factors might be affecting a mushroom's morphology. A woolly pine spike should have smoky gray to blackish spores, and that looks like what we have here. Dan thought that the other mushroom we collected might be in the genus Cortinarius, a group with over 2,000 species found all over the world, all of which have a cinnamon or rusty brown spore color. This spore print suggests that we did indeed find one of the several hundred Cortinarius species in our region. Thanks for joining Dan and me on our fungal foray. Happy mushroom hunting, fellow fungophiles!